Hi there, and welcome again to the Explaining History podcast. And continuing some of the um, podcasts that I've done recently on the machinations uh, surrounding the uh, Russian Civil War and its uh, overlap with the Paris Peace Conference. Today I want to take a, a, a close look at the role of Winston Churchill in the uh, plans to either launch a full-scale war in Russia against the Bolsheviks by the Allied powers or to withdraw completely Natalie. In Britain in 1919, uh, Louis George, the Prime Minister, was wedged between um, the forces of the political left, the Labour Party and the wider Labour movement, and some on the uh, more radical end of the Liberal Party, and the Conservatives who made it the mainstay of Lloyd George's uh, government and upon whom Lloyd George um, re- uh, relied after the uh, coupon election for most of his support. So either decision that he was going to make in Russia was going to be an unpopular one. To wage all-out war might bring levels of unrest in Britain uh, of almost catastrophic uh, nature. Um, The incidences of strike action and the threat of mutiny at the end of the First World War were prevalent, but also to cut and run and to leave the Bolshevik state Uh, to do as it saw fit, would uh, elicit howls of anger from the Conservative Party upon whom Lloyd George relied for his position. And therefore Lloyd George himself was in a kind of no-win situation and either decision he took uh, could see him uh, potentially politically crippled. The ever-belligerent Churchill obviously demanded uh, that Lloyd George make his decision uh, to Churchill the only sin worth, uh, worse uh, than withdrawal itself was indecision. Um, he wanted Lloyd George to either decisively overwhelm the Bolsheviks with uh, Allied uh, infantry, artillery uh, and air power um, and a full naval blockade or to um, withdraw uh, completely. Lloyd George prevaricates, ducking out of the problem neatly by saying that uh, any decision had to be made not by the British government, but by a combination of the Allied powers in Paris. Um, And the scene of decision-making shifts from Westminster to the Paris Peace Conference. Um, Churchill, at that point, heads across the Channel and uh, makes one of his appearances at the conference. Um, He does so on the 14th of February, um, which was the day that Wilson was due to leave and return to uh, America for the uh, mid-conference break. Lloyd George was shocked at this and thought that Churchill was really uh, acting beyond his remit and shouldn't have been behaving in this manner. But this is really pretty much... um, typical of uh, Churchill's modus uh, operandi. He rushed to Paris and uh, he crashed his car on the way um, and raced into the Supreme Council um, as Wilson was leaving. Um, He listened to uh, Churchill and Churchill said basically that the uncertainty uh, over what the Allies planned to do in Russia was very bad for Russian uh, Allied troops there and also for the White Russians and the White Russians and uh, would be uh, considering uh, their strategy based on what they assumed the Allies were willing to offer. Churchill said that withdrawal would be a disaster. He said such a policy would be equivalent to pulling out the linchpin from the whole machine. There would be no further armed resistance to the Bolsheviks in Russia and an interminable vista of violence and misery was all that remained for the whole of Russia. Wilson was not so easily drawn into Churchill's schemes and knew that uh, Allied troops, and particularly American troops, uh, had no place uh, in Russia. 
and were doing nothing there other than costing a lot of money and lives and they were certainly not moving towards uh, Wilson's uh, more preferred and stated goal of the conference which was the establishment of the League of Nations. Churchill didn't give up. He spent the next few days trying to bend the Supreme Council to his will um, and to have a a direct and and ambiguous policy in Russia. But um, uh, Wilson had gone home and uh, Lloyd George was no longer there. Um, And so it meant that uh, there was little that Churchill could achieve. Lloyd George hinted at various things that might placate Churchill, saying oh, that it would be possible to arm the um, white off the white armies, um, and that there might be uh, volunteers that could be raised outside Russia and sent into Russia. And this was uh, an ideas that had been mooted around previously. Um, but certainly he wasn't giving any clear indication of large numbers of uh, troops on, on the ground, full-scale war. And Lloyd George was wise enough to tell Churchill in no uncertain terms that he was forbidden to go uh, trying to create that kind of full-scale military intervention on his own, to not plan military action against um, the Bolsheviks in Russia and not to start agitating for it either. Lloyd George told Churchill that the view of the the war office as well was that uh, an extended extension of the First World War into Russia was a very bad idea and something that should not be considered. Lloyd George said, not merely is it none of our business to interfere with its internal affairs, it would be positively mischievous. It would strengthen and consolidate Bolshevik opinion. This view was disseminated to the rest of the British Empire delegation and also to Colonel House, um, uh, Woodrow Wilson's chief advisor. On his way home, Wilson also sent a message back to the Paris Peace Conference uh, by cable. Um, and it was again a warning for Churchill, saying that he was greatly surprised by Churchill's Russian suggestion. It would be fatal uh, to be led further into the Russian chaos. Now, the um, way in which R- uh, Wilson and Lloyd George were thinking at this time was that the potential for another long drawn out bloody war in uh, Russia was not dissimilar to the potential that the Balkans had offered in 1914. And it was certainly not, in Wilson's uh, view, remotely a good idea to have uh, become briefly involved in the ending of the war started in the Balkans in uh, 1914, uh, only to be dragged into a completely separate and uh, profoundly complicated conflict fought in uh, Russia from 1919 onwards. On February the 19th, the Supreme Council, without uh, Wilson or Lloyd George there, voted that there would be no further discussion of the uh, question of Russia. And by historical um, happenstance, by kind of historical unfortunate coincidence for Clemenceau, this was the day upon which uh, Clemenceau was nearly killed in an assassination attempt um, and was shot several times. He survived um, but was invalid for some considerable period of time. So the, the net result of all of this is that Allied soldiers remained on Russian soil but uh, any sense that they were uh, an army marching on Moscow to overthrow the revolution um, was, um, at this point, entirely gone. They were simply there, an, an army without much of a mission, or several armies without much of a mission. One of the key problems with Russia is that because of the, the chaos that the country was in, there was very little information to be had, so decision-making was particularly poor. On the 17th of February, um, a secret delegation was sent by Colonel House into Russia. William Bullitt, who later became uh, the ambassador to Russia, uh, went 
along with the later fellow traveller Lincoln Stephens. Um, and both of them would have their, their lives in very different ways, shaped by Russia and the new regime uh, that was I- emerging in it. One of the tragic ironies of the uh, trip to Russia by Bullitt and Stephens was that um, both of them assumed they were being sent as interlocutors with the Bolsheviks to negotiate and to um, accept some sort of surrender deal um, or to uh, accept the conditions upon which the Allies would withdraw. Neither of them had been told to do that. In fact, um, Colonel House had been explicit that they were to find information only. Um, but it seems to have completely disregarded this, uh, as does Stephens. Um, the instructions were to negotiate a preliminary agreement with the Russians so that the United States and Great Britain could persuade France to join them in an invitation to Parley, reasonably sure of some results, said Stephens in, in his diaries. Um, the reason why uh, House didn't want negotiations being done in Russia with the Russians was because of the political capital that could be lost if, as was probably likely, uh, Lenin sent back a a flat no to whatever was being uh, suggested, being humiliated by the Bolsheviks, would have done uh, both Woodrow Wilson and David Lloyd George's political capital immense damage, and this is really not what is desirable during uh, such a uh, complicated set of proceedings as the Paris Peace Conference. Both men got to meet Lenin. They had uh, a week of almost unparalleled luxury in uh, Moscow, uh, being uh, fated by the Bolsheviks, put up in former Tsarist palaces, and uh, being able to uh, attend uh, the ballet and opera and other such um, moments of of high culture. And both men were entirely sold on Lenin. It's interesting if you look at the biographies of Bullitt and Stephens. Bullitt later becomes quite the cold warrior um, and has a a profound antipathy towards the Soviet Union. Lincoln Stephens spent much of the rest of his life being enamoured with it, um, both um, being uh, seduced briefly by um, the uh, outward image of the new Bolshevik society emerging. But it seems that Lincoln Stephens continued with this um, slightly deluded romance uh, in his own mind that wonderful things were happening in Russia, along into the Stalin era, uh, and Bullet seems to have reacted with a great anger, uh, having been duped the first time round. And in that, there's a very interesting kind of uh, parable, really, about the development of the fellow traveller movement and its mirror in the uh, kind of anti-Soviet cold warriors that would emerge from the 40s onwards. Um, that the, the a comparable sort of an opposite paths were taken by these two individuals. Not often the history gives us one of those sort of uh, um, split tests, but um, but in, in, here in this case it kind of does. So William Bullitt, by the uh, end of his stay in Moscow, assumed that he had made some kind of provisional deal with the Bolshevik regime. Um, he believed he'd negotiated a ceasefire and that both sides would be willing to make concessions, even as mentioned, that this was not his role and not his remit. Um, The Bolsheviks, for their part, would uh, agree uh, to tolerate the existence of rival governments in Russia, um, occupying different parts of the country, such as parts of Siberia and the Ukraine. And one has to really marvel at the naivety of Bullitt and Stephens in this regard. Of course Lenin had made a treaty with the Germans in March 1918 at the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk and this was something that Lenin saw as uh, unfortunate but expedient simply to buy as much time as possible for the regime. 
When Bullet and Stefan's returned from Russia, uh, Wilson has returned to the Paris Peace Conference and isn't really paying an awful lot of attention to anything that's going on in Russia. To him, the problem of dealing with Germany is complicated enough. And Bullet's mission to Russia had started to cause all sorts of other problems. There had been um, a leak of the mission and it has begun to circulate through the press. Um, there was a fear uh, amongst uh, Britain's press particularly that America and Great Britain were about to legally um, recognise the Soviet regime. And this all happened just as a new uh, Bolshevik Republic established itself in Hungary uh, under the communist Bela Kun. And the, the combination of these factors uh, mean, meant that um, Lloyd George had very, very little room for manoeuvre in a government almost entirely dominated by uh, conservatives who were um, ardent anti-communists and who saw Lloyd George as the most slippery customer in British politics and highly likely to make some kind of expedient deal uh, in order um, to ex uh, further his own political ambitions and to sell large chunks of Europe out to the, the Red Menace. And it is here that uh, Britain's premier right-wing newspaper then and now the Daily Mail uh, intervenes. Uh, the Daily Mail, all owned by Lord Northcliffe, um, published an article by the journalist Henry Wickham Steed, um, who had been uh, one that distinguished himself as a, a war correspondent. And Wickham Steed um, claimed that the Principo meeting um, had been now resumed. If you uh, recall, if you listen to the previous podcast I did on um, the machinations behind the scenes uh, of the Russian Civil War, there were plans to meet the Bolsheviks on the island of Principo. And the Daily Mail put the motivations behind all this mysteriously to, of course, in their view, Jewish financiers. Um, there had been a, a subtle and in many ways not so subtle vein of anti-Semitism in not just the Daily Mail but in other British newspaper reporting of the time. And in something which could be almost uh, mirrored right now, in uh, a century later, uh, Lloyd George, once when having breakfast with William Bullitt, held out a copy of the Daily Mail under his nose and said to him, as long as the British press is doing this kind of thing, how can you expect me to be sensible about Russia? The scare story about uh, Lloyd George's supposed um, planned recognition of Russia uh, placed immense pressure on him. Conservative MPs uh, began organising. 200 of them signed a letter to Lloyd George demanding that he do not go ahead with this supposed recognition. And on the 16th of April, he was forced to the dispatch box in the House of Commons, where he said that this had never been discussed at the Paris Peace Conference and that it was entirely out of the question. Um, he was uh, quizzed on the nature of William Bullitt's mission and there was, um, he said briefly, there was a suggestion that there was some young American, that there was some young American who had come back. And he did not mention Bullitt's name or the fact that he had had uh, meetings with Bullitt on his return from Russia. The fact that William Bullitt was sidelined in this way uh, obviously did his ego immense harm. Um, he had no um, contact with the president who had very little interest uh, in, in what he had managed to uh, achieve in, or thought he'd managed to achieve in Russia. He didn't in reality achieve nothing at all. There's no way that Lenin was going to agree to any of his terms. Um, and the sense that Bullitt had of his own importance uh, was also punctured months later when the Paris Peace Conference produced the Treaty of Versailles. Bullitt thought that he had managed to broker a far more effective deal uh, than the, uh, the German treaty 
um, and he sent a letter of resignation to um, Wilson um, and spent the rest of his uh, time in France on the French Riviera. It was ironic that he became the first uh, American ambassador to the Soviet Union in 1934 to be followed by the socialite Joseph Davis, of whom I've spoken before. France had to put up with the cordon sanitaire uh, around uh, Russia, the uh, creation of a series of friendly allied states that would act as uh, a buffer to uh, Bolshevik expansion, and also as a barrier between the potential meetup between the Bolsheviks and the Germans. Both Wilson and Lloyd George knew that uh, any kind of dialogue with the Soviet Union now was too politically toxic, um, partly because of the fears that Lloyd George had about his own backbenches and also because of the way in which it could be uh, misrepresented or distorted in the newspapers, i.e. that the two leaders might be willing to roll over to communism or appease his frightening political phenomena surging from the east. Both secretly hoped that there would be some kind of transformation to a, a liberal uh, post-terror regime in Russia, but obviously this was wildly unrealistic. And both hoped, um, they briefly toyed with the idea of using food shipments to uh, make some kind of gesture of amity towards Russia. Obviously Herbert Hoover who was the head of the Allied Relief Administration, who uh, made sure that there were enormous amounts of, of food resources going into Russia, um, and who, as a kind of a political figure, whenever widely criticised for the Great Depression, it should always be remembered um, the amount that he did in terms of uh, creating food relief for Europe after, after the war and during, particularly in Belgium. Um, he had the same, roughly the same view of uh, Russia as Wilson did, that however abhorrent the Bolshevik regime was, it was largely uh, the creation of the regime that came before it and the creation of intolerable circumstances. A discreet message was sent to the Bolsheviks that if they stopped propagandising in the West, uh, then they would ha receive substantial aid and help. Um, as a result, and this eventually might help to pour oil on the troubled waters of Russia and calm things down and steer the population away from uh, radical ideas. Um, the uh, lack of knowledge of Russia uh, meant that neither uh, Lloyd George or Wilson really understood that the vast bulk of the population didn't really have radical ideas um, other than wanting to manage to secure more land, and it was the regime um, that was uh, radical as opposed to the, the people at large. Help came in the guise of the Arctic explorer Fishtof Nansen, um, who was uh, suggested um, by um, Hoover and Wilson to uh, head up a neutral relief effort um, where, the, where countries that had not waged a war in Russia or have any involvement in it, including Norway, um, were to send food and medicines with substantial help from the Allied powers to Russia in uh, return for a ceasefire. Um, Nansen sent a letter to Lenin um, and the response uh, came back that there would be no discussion of any kind of ceasefire without formal pe a formal peace conference. Um, at this point, the Allies kind of washed their hands of uh, Russia and of um, humanitarian relief, though obviously it does continue uh, under Hoover to some extent. By May 1919, Admiral Kolchak had swept the uh, Bolsheviks out of 300 square miles of their territory and um, at this point an excited Churchill uh, decided to recognise the Kolchak government or offer it at least partial recognition. Churchill wrote, the moment chosen was almost exactly the moment when that declaration was almost certainly too late. 
the uh, uh, front by Kolchak against the Bolsheviks was the, the last uh, high point of the uh, white forces. And by June, this had been broken, by the, by the end of June anyway, by the Red Army, who smashed through Kolchak's centre um, and forced the, uh, forced the white armies back hundreds of kilometres. And this happened to coincide with the end of the Paris Peace Conference, where the Germans were about to sign the Treaty of Versailles, and at that point there was precious little interest in anything else, thus ending, really, the uh, interest of the big three powers in the affairs of Russia. And the final drawdown by um, early 1921, um, January 1921, in point of fact, uh, ended the uh, intervention in Russia altogether. And two months later, Britain had even signed a trade deal with the new Bolshevik regime. Anyway, I hope you found this interesting. That's the last I'm going to talk about the Russian Civil War for some time. And the next topic of uh, our journey through the complexities of the Paris Peace Conference is going to be the development of the League of Nations. Anyway, I hope you found this useful. I'll catch you on the next podcast. Check out our Facebook page. Come by and say hi. It'd be great to hear from you. All the best. Bye-bye.